Uh, I'm excited to talk with you all. Thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to tell you today about some research we've been doing lately to try to make predictive models of how cell fates change over time. And my talk in a nutshell is basically that measuring multiple modalities within the same cell can give you snapshots into how cells change over time. So the problem that we're interested in uh, addressing and modeling here is basically um, to build um, uh, computational models of the molecular changes that cells undergo as they transition from one fate to another. So think of a stem cell differentiating into um, some other cell type. And the ideal type of data that we would want for, for this sort of modeling would be to put a little molecular camera inside each cell and watch it over time and then repeat that thousands of times. But what we can actually do with single cell sequencing is we can take sort of a vertical slice of the population of cells at a given point and measure the gene expression or other molecular profiles of the cells. And so what we wanna to try to do from these sort of vertical samples of these differentiating cells is to try to build some kind of um, predictive model so that we can predict the future molecular state of cell J at some time T greater than time Ti where we observe the cell. And because of the, the nature of cell differentiation being asynchronous um, and our inability to follow the same cell over time, this is a challenging problem. Um, so cells start differentiating at different times and each cell's journey takes a different length of time, but we only see each cell at one time point. So the key modeling assumption that we're going to use to make progress on this problem is basically to say, well, we know something about the molecular steps that a gene goes through when transcription happens. And we're going to use that to constrain this otherwise underdetermined problem. So if, you're, if you've been following single cell methods, um, you may recognize this setup as uh, a pitch for RNA velocity. Um, Stenlin Arson and Peter Karchenko came up with this really nice idea several years ago where they realized that you can view single cell RNA sequencing as multimodal data where you can observe both nascent mRNA and mature mRNA. And you can distinguish to some extent between these species by looking for reads that land within introns um, versus reads that cross uh, exon junctions. And so if you see a molecule that doesn't have any introns that has splice, splice reads, um, that can come from only from a splice molecule. Whereas if you see reads um, that cross the junction between an intron and an exon, then you know that that uh, junction is in an unspliced RNA molecule. And because we know that an RNA has to be spliced before it matures, um, we can predict where a cell is in this induction repression life cycle by looking at the ratio between unspliced and spliced transcripts. So when a gene gets turned on, um, it first has to be induced and there will be a period where um, you observe unspliced RNA preceding spliced RNA. So by looking at a particular gene in a particular cell and examining both U and S, you can determine whether the gene is currently being induced or repressed. And you can think of this insight in several ways. You can think of this as a differential equation system that describes um, the biochemical process of transcription in terms of several rate parameters. You can also think of it as a probabilistic model that constrains the joint distribution of U and S over time. And so uh, the initial RNA velocity paper showed that um, if you make a few simplifying assumptions, like assuming that the system has reached steady state, you can estimate the parameters of this differential equation uh, using linear regression. And um, then for a particular cell, using these parameters, you can estimate a velocity vector that tells the likely future state of the cell based on where it is on this induction repression cycle. But that's the assumption of cells being at steady state is kind of a, a bummer because you really want to use this in cells that are not at steady state. And so um, Fabian Tice's group came up with a, an approach that uses all the cells to estimate the rate parameters of the system, not just the cells at steady state. And their insight is that you can view this as a latent variable estimation problem where each cell has some unobserved um, uh, abstract time, kind of like pseudo time. And uh, once you have a guess for this, the time of a cell, you can use that to estimate its parameters. And so um, 
you can iteratively perform a sort of expectation maximization where you take a best guess of the time of each cell and then estimate the rate parameters of a gene using those estimated times um, and then use the estimated rate parameters to update the time again and repeat. And this is a big, uh, a big boost because now we can use all the cells and not just um, sort of the upper corner of the phase portrait to fit the parameters. So the first project I'm going to tell you about is how we um, essentially added a new dimension to this approach by incorporating uh, measurements from single cell multiomic data where you can measure epigenome and transcriptome in the same cell. So our, our idea was relatively simple. Basically, the, the idea is um, if we're thinking about modeling transcription in this way, we really need to incorporate the chromatin state of the locus that's being transcribed because a promoter first has to be opened before it can be transcribed. And so if we have data like from 10X Multiome or related technologies where we can see uh, the chromatin state of a locus and the unspliced RNA and the spliced RNA in the same cell, we can add a third differential equation to our system and describe the joint distribution of the chromatin accessibility, the unspliced RNA and the spliced RNA over time. So we developed this approach where we um, uh, added a new differential equation to the system that describes chromatin opening and chromatin closing, and then makes the transcription rate a function of the chromatin state of the promoter and linked regulatory elements. And so um, because this is a simple linear ODE system, you can solve it analytically um, in closed form. And so given the parameters in this table, um, if you know the values of those parameters, you can estimate the, the data likelihood of a particular set of CU and S values across the population of cells. So just to give you a sense for um, how the model uh, expands once we take chromatin into account, here are the parameters um, in the model. So now we have a chromatin opening and chromatin closing rate, a transcription rate, splicing rate, and degradation rate, and then um, switch times for when chromatin uh, begins closing, for when transcription initiates, and when transcription terminates. And so uh, essentially we can take the same framework that Tice lab developed and um, once we formulate our, our data likelihood using this differential equation, we can find the maximum likelihood estimates of the rate parameters by minimizing mean squared error. This is sort of like a normal uh, assumption about the, uh, the errors, deviations from this differential equation. Um, and then once we have a way of estimating the parameters using maximum likelihood, we can um, estimate the times of each cell given those parameters and iterate doing expectation maximization. Now, um, in this case, when we add the third differential equation, there's a little uh, extra challenge, which is that it suddenly becomes very hard to invert the system analytically to find time. And so to get around that problem, um, we just make a, a lookup table um, where we uh, evaluate the equation um, in the forward direction at a uniformly spaced set of times, and then just look up uh, which time has the closest um, uh, differential equation solution value. And so then we can proceed just as in the SC Velo paper and iteratively estimate the cell times and rate parameters using EM. And we can also rank genes by their likelihood after fitting and determine which genes um, are well explained by this uh, ODE model. And so we tested this out on some um, 10x multiome data. Uh, this was a couple of years ago when we tried this. And so there were not very many data sets available, but we tried the sample data set from 10x from developing mouse cortex. And we just did a simple test where um, we ran our model on the data and we compared the velocity vectors predicted by our approach with the velocity vectors predicted by the RNA only model. And you know, some some things, some details are known about the system. Um, it's known that Radial glia produce intermediate progenitors, which then make the cortical layers. And radial glia can also divide in a different way to make um, glial progenitors. And so if you look at the at qualitatively at the velocity vectors predicted by these two approaches, you can see that ours matches much more uh, with what's expected in this system. And so this is reassuring that incorporating the chromatin does give you some benefit in terms of predicting the future states of cells. Um, but there's several other really interesting aspects of the modeling framework um, that we wanted to explore. 
And so the first is that if you just think qualitatively about what um, this model says about the relationship between chromatin and transcription, um, there's two ways that chromatin and gene expression can be out of sync. And this was actually one of the things that motivated us to develop this approach because um, the ability to measure both gene expression and epigenome in the same cell allows you to see not just when those two modalities are in sync, but also when they're transiently or permanently out of sync. And so um, in, our, in our framework here, there are two ways in which we predict chromatin and gene expression can be out of sync. The first we call priming, and this happens when chromatin starts to open, but there are no spliced or unspliced transcripts present in the cell. And so this creates a transient interval where the rate of change of chromatin is positive, but the rate of change of gene expression is zero. There's also a, an interval, um, uh, which is a relatively novel prediction from our model, um, where gene expression and chromatin accessibility can be out of sync on the backside when a gene is being turned off. And so what, what our model predicts is that when chromatin starts to drop, gene expression can continue, transcription can continue as the chromatin starts to close. And so you can get this transient period where gene expression transcription level is increasing while chromatin is decreasing. And so we can segment our phase portrait um, into four states, which we call primed, coupled on, decoupled, and coupled off. Um, another qualitative prediction from this, this model is that there are two potential orders of events that happen when a gene is turned on and then turned off. And we call these model one and model two. So the first one, model one, is that chromatin can begin closing while transcription is still active. The second is that chromatin can begin, can begin closing only after transcription has ceased. And in principle, we should be able to distinguish between these scenarios um, by um, fitting different combinations of parameters and comparing the, the data likelihood. And so we were curious to see whether we could identify different examples of genes that are best explained by model one versus model two. So to do this, we, we looked at the same data set from developing mouse cortex and um, the, the model likelihood um, is significantly better for model one for this gene SATB2 and significantly better for model two for GRIA2. And qualitatively, the, the way you can see the difference between a gene that is a model one versus model two gene is if you make a portrait, phase portrait of unspliced versus spliced counts, um, and then color by the chromatin accessibility. Um, if a gene is a model one gene, you should see the highest chromatin accessibility at the end of the induction phase. So this, this position just above the diagonal line. Whereas for a mechanism two gene, you should see the highest chromatin accessibility near the end of the repression phase because chromatin continues to open while the uh, gene is being transcriptionally repressed. And so we can see um, that these two examples are particularly clear where the um, induction phase has high chromatin accessibility here, but the repression phase actually has high chromatin accessibility for this gene. And if we uh, compare the likelihoods across all the genes that we fit, um, it's about a two to one ratio of genes that are better described by model one versus model two. We also looked into um, the uh, functional annotations of these genes um, to see if there were any differences between them. We couldn't find many significant gene ontology terms. Um, model one genes were slightly enriched for transcription factors and model two genes were slightly enriched for cell cycle genes. But what we did notice is that the model two genes um, tended to be expressed earlier. So the cells um, that had an, an earlier inferred latent time had higher expression of the model two genes. We're not sure what the significance of that is, but it could be um, sort of different gene regulatory mechanisms for genes that you need early versus late in a, a cell fate specification. The other thing that's really cool about our model is that um, we segment each gene into these four states and we can actually quantify the relative length of time that a gene occupies each of the states. So we can rank genes um, according to how long the priming or decoupling interval is predicted to be. Uh, and I think, yeah, so if we look across all the genes uh, and make a histogram of how many genes have a priming or decoupling interval of a given length, um, we, can, we can see that there are some extreme examples like this gene, 
is one of the top outliers in terms of having a long priming interval. This gene is one of the ones that has a long decoupling interval. And so we can use these um, inferred parameters to identify uh, genes that have either long or short priming or decoupling intervals. And um, as a qualitative uh, way of illustrating this sort of phenomenon uh, of RNA and epigenome discordance, um, if you make a UMAP plot and color the cells by the amount of chromatin accessibility or um, unspliced gene expression and by the state that's inferred by our model, what you should expect to see if the model is you know, fitting sensibly is that um, parts uh, cells that are in either a red or green state um, should have chromatin accessibility and gene expression values that look different. And so you can see that qualitatively, indeed, if you look at, for example, this green region that's predicted to be in the decoupled state, the accessibility is still high, but the gene expression is rapidly decreasing. And similarly here, if you look at this primed state, there's no gene expression, but the chromatin has already started to open. And interestingly, if you look across um, all genes and uh, count up the number of genes that are in each state, you can see that there's kind of a cascade of genes, a lot of genes that are primed early on, and then uh, more genes that are decoupled uh, later in the process. We've also applied the model to a number of other data sets, including this one from human cortical neurogenesis. And we were also able to identify clear examples of model one versus model two genes in this setting as well. Um, another thing that's really interesting that you can start to look at with this type of data is the relationship between the expression at the RNA level of a transcription factor and the accessibility of genomic locations that have the binding site for that transcription factor. So we looked at um, chromatin accessibility peaks in our, in our set of cells that have the binding site for a particular transcription factor. And then we compared the transcription level of that gene in the same cell. And um, if we sort the cells by the inferred latent time from our model, what we saw consistently for a bunch of transcription factors is that the expression of the TF preceded the accessibility of its binding sites. And there was variability in terms of how long that uh, time lag was, but it was a pretty clear trend that the transcription factor expression preceded the time of the maximum accessibility of its binding sites. And just to give you a qualitative sense for um, what this looks like, EGR1 was one of the more extreme examples in terms of the transcription factor appearing long before the motif became accessible. And you can see that in the radial glia and early neural progenitor cells, the transcription factor has this pulse of gene expression. And then if you look at the um, later cells that are forming the cortical layers as they're developing, the motif gradually becomes more and more accessible. And so one of the really interesting opportunities, um, one of the ways that this sort of analysis can help you to have important disease relevant insights is to, to try to understand potential gene regulatory mechanisms involving disease associated variant loci. And so to, to, to motivate this, um, the two genes I showed that are really clear examples of model one versus model two, robo two and SATB2, these genes um, are both strongly implicated in um, schizophrenia. So the robo two gene has seven linked GWAS hits and uh, SATB2 has three linked GWAS hits. And in total, 65 of the genes that we fit um, by, the, by the model have linked schizophrenia GWAS hits, and these are mostly non-coding variants. So we wanted to look at um, what this modeling approach could tell us about the relationships between these SNP loci and um, the chromatin accessibility and gene expression of nearby genes. So um, we performed a, a clustering analysis where we grouped uh, variants based on two dimensions. One is the time when this, uh, the SNP locus has its maximum accessibility. And then the other is uh, delta T, which is the length of time between when the SNP becomes accessible 
and when the linked gene is expressed. And uh, what what started to come out here is that there's kind of four different classes of SNPs in terms of their relationship to the expression of the linked gene. So you, you can see um, early SNP accessibility that precedes gene expression. You can see late SNP accessibility that precedes gene expression. You can see early SNP accessibility that comes after gene expression. And then there's a fourth possibility, which doesn't happen as often, which is um, both late SNP accessibility and uh, preceding gene expression. And um, so we were able to group all of our variants into, into these four buckets. And here are three examples. So this, this variant here is linked to the UNC5C gene, and it has very high accessibility early, but the gene doesn't come on until much later when the cortical layers are forming. Uh, here's an example of late SNP accessibility uh, that precedes gene expression. And uh, that SNP is linked to the MEF2C gene. And then here's an example of early SNP accessibility that comes after gene expression where the highest SNP accessibility is in these cells, but the highest expression is in the radial glia and intermediate progenitors. And so um, this sort of uh, information is, is helpful if you wanna identify, for example, um, which cell type or which developmental stage do I need to look at in order to determine how this disease associated variant is exerting its effect on gene expression. Okay, so um, I've just presented the multivelo approach, and now I'm going to tell you about um, some follow up work where we've tried to make this framework more robust and more general um, and more useful. So, as, as neat as I think this approach is, it has a lot of limitations. Um, here are some of them um, each gene is fit independently and has its own notion of latent time. We assume discrete transcriptional induction and repression phases. Uh, induction is always assumed to occur and start at time zero, fixed transcription rate, so the assumption of a single differential equation for all the cells in the population, and so forth. And so we wanted to develop an approach that relaxes a lot of these assumptions and puts the type, this type of analysis on more firm footing. So essentially what we did was to take the expectation maximization framework and upgrade it to a variational inference framework. And we figured out uh, a, a relatively elegant way to do this um, using variational autoencoders. So there's, there's a number of intuitions that led us to this model. You can think of it from a neural networks perspective um, in terms of taking an autoencoder and then swapping out the decoder with the solution to the differential equation. Um, you can also think of it from a Bayesian modeling framework where we formulate this generative model um, in terms of... Uh, the observed variables U and S uh, that are generated through some generative process from the rate parameters of the differential equation. Um, and then if you formulate this generative model, uh, you can use autoencoding variational Bayes to uh, estimate an inference model so that given U and S, you can, you can estimate the distributions of the latent variables that generated them. Um, so from, from either perspective, you kind of converge on this variational autoencoder approach that um, algorithmically proceeds by taking unspliced and spliced counts into the encoder network, predicting a cell state and a cell time in the bottleneck layer of the network, and then um, estimating the parameters of the differential equation in the decoder network and using them to reconstruct the original UNS counts. And this has a lot of advantages. Um, it's much more statistically rigorous. You get distributional estimates of C and T instead of point estimates. Uh, and also um, you can take advantage of all the uh, nice work that people have done in terms of making neural network training fast and memory efficient. You can also set prior distributions on times, states, and rates. And so if you have, for example, a data set with multiple observation times, you can set a prior distribution so that each cell um, is expected to have a time correlated with its real capture time. And um, you can infer distributional estimates of the rate parameters um, because they, you can view them as variational parameters. And then you can also change the likelihood so that instead of having to do all kinds of heuristic normalization, you can directly model the data as Poisson. And so we, we evaluated our, our model 
against a bunch of other um, single cell RNA velocity approaches that have emerged. And one, one way in which we have a, a really clear ad advantage is if you have a data set where there are multiple capture times available, because we can set a prior distribution for the, the cell times, we can ultimately derive cell times that are much more correlated with the real capture times. And so this goes a long way towards um, um, you know, fixing this problem of why are my velocity vectors pointing backwards? We can also um, evaluate the mean squared error and uh, the log likelihood, and we, we have a significant boost compared to other approaches in that department as well. So to give you a qualitative sense for how this can improve, um, here are three complex data sets that all have um, multiple capture times. And uh, we can see that if we use SCVELO, for example, it predicts that the cells times are exactly anti-correlated with the real capture times. Um, and similarly for uh, this data set from IPS reprogramming and developing mouse brain. And we also evaluated without using the time prior and we still have a boost. But of course, incorporating the time labels is you know, significantly helpful. We can also model qualitative features of these differentiation processes that the other models struggle to capture. For example, um, because of the restrictive like single ODE assumption that previous work used, it was really hard to fit genes that are repressed early or induced late. And we don't have that issue. And more importantly, we can model genes that bifurcate as cells develop. So uh, here's an example from the uh, developing pancreas where this gene GNG12 gets induced specifically in the beta cells and a little bit less in the delta cells. And if you try to use the previous approach that assumes a single ODE for the whole population, you essentially try to squish all the cells into this single trajectory, whereas we can model the complexity of the multiple populations emerging over time. And this ability is especially key for scaling up to whole organs or whole embryos. And so we were able to use the, the approach on this data set from Stenlin Arson's lab um, that was published in Nature, where they did 300,000 cells from uh, many different time points of the developing mouse brain. And um, tellingly, even though Stenlin Arson and, and Joella Lomano, the first author, developed RNA velocity, they didn't use it in this paper because this data set is just too complex for the single ODE model. But with our approach, especially when we can take into account the capture times, we're able to fit all the cells to a single model in one go using this BAE framework. And we get velocity vectors that are quite congruent with what people expect qualitatively. Um, and they're also highly correlated with the true capture times of the cells. And one thing we noticed um, about the estimated parameters, which is really cool, is if you look at the, the variance estimates for the cell state and cell time that are estimated by the model, it predicts that the radial glia and the neural progenitors have the highest state uncertainty and the highest time variance. And so this suggests that the model is internally sort of learning that these progenitor cells have actual biological state uncertainty because they're undergoing fate specification. So we thought if we can do the whole brain, why not try a whole embryo? And so we, we tried this data set from um, Jay Shinduri and Cole Trapnell that was published in Nature. Uh, Two million cells from, uh, I forget how many time points, maybe six or seven time points. And when they initially published this data set, they did a pseudo time analysis of the whole embryo, but they did it in a painfully manual way where they first clustered the cells into 10 main trajectories and then divided them into 56 sub trajectories and manually performed a pseudo time analysis on all of the 56 sub trajectories. And um, in contrast, we were able to do this in a single analysis, no tweaking default parameters uh, and get actual reasonable uh, latent time estimates and fate predictions um, that you know qualitatively match with what you would expect uh, from this system. And yeah, we were, we were able to identify several cases where the pseudo time um, didn't really make sense and was actually anti-correlated with the real capture times of the cells. Whereas, you know, because we take it into account the, the prior uh, information of these capture times, we're able to infer cell times that are much more congruent with the real uh, cell capture times.
And again, we observe this nice property that the uh, time variance and state variance seem to be the highest for the progenitor cells and gradually decrease as the cells differentiate. Um, another thing that uh, is really appealing about this framework is that, particularly when you take the, the cell capture times into account, you can actually assign physical units to the parameters that are estimated by the model. And in particular, um, if you have a latent time that has real units of days or hours, you can do unit analysis to identify um, the units of the rate parameters in transcripts per minute. And so we did this um, for the, the genes that, uh, whose parameters we estimated. Um, this is a histogram across five different data sets of the, um, the values of these parameters in transcripts per minute. And we found that the ranges that were being estimated by the model are quite consistent with published transcription rates from single molecule fish, where you can actually look at individual transcripts appearing over time. Okay, um, and then the, the last thing that's really nice about this framework is we can directly model raw counts just by changing the, the likelihood of the observation model um, to be a Poisson rather than uh, say a Gaussian distribution. And so in this case, um, we can essentially just uh, add a Poisson distribution outside the differential equation solution so that our ODE gives us the mean of a Poisson and then we can sample the observed counts from Poisson that has that time varying mean. And we can still set uh, a prior distribution on the rates and infer posterior distributions on, for example, the, the mean of this Poisson. And if we, if we fit this on real data, um, it fits very well. And you can see how sparse some of these genes are, particularly for the unspliced counts. Um, but if, if, you, if you compare the, the fitted values in black with the observed values that are colored by cell type in the background, you can see that we're fitting pretty well. And Okay, um, we evaluated this with a lot of metrics. I don't have time to go into at the moment, but I wanna end with this thing that I think is really cool, which is that um, when we dug into what our model is actually doing a little bit more, we realized we're actually really solving the chemical master equation when we use this Poisson model. Um, so a little bit of background, the CME is like the most general stochastic ODE that describes chemical reactions involving conversions of discrete species. And people have pointed out that you can view this RNA velocity ODE as a special case of the CME, where, for example, you take moments of this stochastic equation. And so you can write out um, our ODE uh, as this more general stochastic ODE um, in, in probabilistic notation here where basically at each moment in time, you either um, do or don't undergo one of these molecular conversions with some probability. And then if you take the moments of this stochastic equation, you get exactly back the linear ODE that we started with. And so in general, the chemical master equation is intractable, but people worked out uh, that in certain special cases, you can actually solve it analytically. And in particular, if you have a system with monomolecular reactions, which is where um, every reaction either uh, converts one species to another, creates a species, or destroys a single species, then in that special case, you actually have an analytical solution to the CME, and it turns out to be a product Poisson distribution whose mean follows an ODE. And this is exactly the form of the distribution that Velovie fits which is a Poisson with mean given by the ODE solution. <clears throat> and so um, we kind of came at this from an empirical direction, but in the end, we arrived at something that's um, pretty theoretically motivated um, and has uh, a nice interpretation. And so if, if we apply this to real data sets like this um, data set of human hematopoiesis, and we calculate the correctness of the directions inferred from our model, based on what's known about hematopoiesis from facts studies, um, we can significantly more accurately predict the future states of cells, and we can do it directly from the raw counts without having to do any normalization. So here are some examples of the genes that we can fit with a discrete model, and you can see that 
Um, as I pointed out before, the black points overlap really well with the points colored by cell type in the background. And uh, let me spend one minute on some of the metrics we use to evaluate. So um, we evaluated our, me our method using both the continuous uh, Gaussian distribution likelihood and the Poisson likelihood. So the last four bars are our method. And based on uh, correlation between the inferred latent time and real time, um, we do very well. And also um, based on the gene log likelihood, um, we do very well compared to this model pyro velocity, which is the only other model that actually fits the discrete counts. And if we look at the continuous model um, using mean squared error, we also do very well compared to these other approaches. So with that, I'll wrap up. Um, and most of what I presented today was from Chen and Yi Chen, and uh, these are our collaborators also. Thank you.